All right, good morning. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Okay, good morning. We'll be starting the LZ seminar in just a couple of minutes once we get to the top of the hour. All right, good morning from the Sanford Underground Research Facility. I'm Mike Headley. I'm the executive director with the South Dakota Science and Technology Authority and also the lab director here at SURF. Welcome to the scientific seminar to review the startup of the LZ dark matter experiment. On behalf of the SDSDA board of directors and our staff, I'd like to congratulate the over 250 members of the LZ collaboration on reaching this major milestone. Uh, it's been really our pleasure to partner with you in support of world leading dark matter research right here at SURF. Congratulations. Before the seminar begins, I'd like to recognize the South Dakota Governor's Office. I'd also like to recognize three South Dakota foundations that provided the funding to secure approximately 80% of the xenon that was required for the LC experiment. Without them, we wouldn't be here today celebrating this, this uh, event. These foundations include the South Dakota Community Foundation, the South Dakota State University Foundation, and the University of South Dakota uh, Foundation. Thank you all for your strong support of underground science research here in South Dakota at SURF. All right, so now it's time for our scientific seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the day. First is LZ spokesperson, Hugh Lippincott from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And the second is L LZ physics coordinator, Aaron Manalese of Lawrence Berkeley Lab in Berkeley, California. Hugh and Aaron, over to you. Um, thanks a lot, Mike, for that introduction. And thanks again to Sir for hosting us. Um, as we go through, I think we're gonna hold questions until the end. So um, feel free to put questions into the Q&A um, or raise your hand at the end and we will stop at the end and hopefully have enough time for, uh, for some questions. So I guess I will share my screen. Um, all right, uh, thank you everybody for coming today um, as we get to present our first science results from the Lex Zeppelin experiment. <clears throat> so first I wanna highlight the 35 institutions, 250 scientists, engineers, and technicians who have contributed to this experiment, um, and particularly also our funding, uh, funding agencies. It's really been um, an amazing effort of many, many people over the last eight years to put this experiment together. And I'm very, very excited to be representing them today, um, all of these people who've really put their heart and soul in this experiment. So let's start with dark matter. There's strong consensus regarding how much stuff there is in the universe, um, but by that same token, we only understand about 5% of it. And in particular, of the matter in the universe, which we think is roughly 30%, most of that, 85%, is a mystery to us, and we call this stuff dark matter. Now, the evidence for this is quite strong and consistent across all scales, from sort of the smallest galactic scales to the cosmic microwave background. Um, we see this stuff, we see the absence of matter through its gravitational influence on our universe and the uh, history of our universe. I think to me, one of the most important aspects of this is that we would not be here without dark matter providing that binding material that brought sort of structure, our galaxy together. Um, so it's sort of a critical part of the evolution in our history in our universe. So once you sort of accept that it exists, the next question you might ask is, well, what do we know about it? So we call it dark in the sense that it does not interact with light or electromagnetism in the usual way. What we do know is that it interacts gravitationally, that it's nearly collisionless, that it's stable, so it's been around since the very beginning of the universe, that it's relatively slow, moving at approximately 10 to the minus three times the speed of light. <clears throat> the local density uh, is roughly 0.3 GeV per cc, 
which depending on your, your favorite candidate for dark matter means that when you make a fist, there's a dark matter particle in your fist. There's actually quite a lot because they're moving through your fist, but by density, there's one such thing. Another thing that's important to note is that all of these things go together to form a particle that is not in our standard model. So dark matter is something completely new to physics. It's beyond the standard model. And so we're looking for new physics as we do this search. One of the best motivated candidates is a wimpy thermal relic. So what I mean by that is it's weakly interacting massive particle. So massive particle is quite technical. Um, here we're mostly looking in sort of the MeV to 100 TeV scale. Um, these are from cosmological bounds. And then the weak scale interaction leads to the correct density today, that 0.3 GeV per cc I was talking about. So this type of candidate, the WIMP, uh, the thermal relic, um, is highly motivated. Um, and people have been looking for it now for, I'd say, you know, in earnest about 20 years. And so there are important constraints for many dark matter results in a number of different ways of searching it. However, there remain many, many interesting models that we are probing with the experiment that we're going to be talking about today. And I won't go into any details. You know, you can talk about supersymmetric models, twin Higgs, various others. There's a nice recent summary as part of the Snowmass white paper, which I've given the archive reference to on this page and many references therein. But I think the conclusion to me is that we are now probing some of the most interesting models from, 20, from the last 20 years um, with the experiment that we're talking about now. So how do you actually do this type of experiment? At, at sort of the very basic level, you fill a detector with your favorite material and you wait for a WIMP to scatter off of it. And here we have a nice picture of a WIMP hitting a nucleus and you get a recoil. <clears throat> and that's really all it is. It's elastic scattering. It's just like when you're playing pool and you hit the cue ball into the eight ball and the eight ball hopefully goes into the pocket. Um, so a few details, if you, you know, if go back to your first year of freshman physics, and you do kinematics, you can write down exactly almost the key parameters that we're looking for in this experiment, right? So the mass of a, nu of a nucleus in our case is about 131 GeV for xenon say for a mass of a dark matter particle of about 100 GeV, those are roughly equal masses. This is elastic scattering of equal mass uh, objects. The velocity, as I said, is coming from our understanding of the galaxy. And that leads you to a recoil energy, an energy deposition of, a, of approximately a few keV. So we're looking for very, very low energy recoils by uh, the standards of um, particle physics. But that's sort of the very basics of these experiments. Now, it's important to note that this is a very, very rare process if, uh, if it's visible at all. So the current best limits um, from a number of experiments are at order a few times 10 to the minus 47 centimeters, uh, centimeters squared. So that's the cross section. That would be equivalent to 10 million light years of lead. So you can shoot a dark matter particle through 10 million light years of lead and expect only one interaction at the end of that 10 million light years. So this is extremely rare. <clears throat> um, and I think a few things to note about this uh, process. So on the right in the plot, um, I've plotted the uh, prediction of rate and counts per ton per year for a number of popular targets. <clears throat> and so I think there's two things I want to point out. Uh, one is that this is an exponentially falling spectrum. So you really want to look particularly at the lowest energies. Again, I was talking about 3 keV on the previous slide. And then second is that there are differences between targets depending on the interaction you're looking for. So xenon in this particular uh, uh, version is the, the highest rate because there's an enhancement that goes like the size of the nucleus. So xenon being a nice big nucleus, you get this enhancement factor, and that's why you see that the lowest energies, the xenon uh, rate, predicted rate is, is the highest. But even so, you're only talking about a handful of counts per ton per year of, of search. So that makes it very, very difficult. One thing that saves us, the reason why we even get this few number of counts is because there's a lot of wimps around, right? Billions are passing through us every second. And so we can look for these few counts. So what's the catch? Excuse me. The catch is backgrounds. So radiation is everywhere. For example, the human body emits kilobecquerel of gamma rays. So Aaron right now is blasting me with kilobecquerel of gamma rays, for which I thank him. <laughs> um, so the fight in these dark matter experiments is to get through the something like a trillion events per second in a ton scale experiment to see the two and a half events per year that might be um, from the dark matter. And those sources come from cosmic rays, from the radioactive environment, from radioactive contamination. So the name of the game in dark matter is to maximize sensitivity to the thing you're looking for while minimizing the backgrounds. So in the next few slides, we'll talk about how we do that and how LZ in particular does that. The first thing we do is we find a really, really nice underground laboratory and we build our experiment there. <clears throat> so we're talking to you from Leeds, South Dakota, uh, where we are being hosted by the Stanford Underground Research Facility. And here is this lovely picture of the two head frames of SURF, uh, the Yates and the Ross. And our experiment is sited 40, uh, 4,800 feet underground in the old cavern where Ray Davis built his Nobel Prize winning uh, neutrino experiment. 
At this depth, the muon flux, again, the cosmic ray rate that if you were running on the surface would blast our detector to crazy, um, is reduced by a factor of 10 to the six. So this allows us to actually turn on our experiment in the first place by running in this deep underground lab. And I want to again thank them for being so supportive to us over the last several years. So now I'll talk a little bit about LZ. <clears throat> so LZ, uh, like many dark matter experiments, is effectively you know, an onion where each layer of the onion is trying to knock down the backgrounds uh, more and more. So I'll actually start in the center. In the center of xenon, of, uh, of sorry, of LZ, is a xenon time projection chamber. And I'll talk about it in the next few slides. Outside the central TPC, we have a, a veto system called the xenon skin. Outside the xenon skin, we have a second veto system that we call the outer detector. Um, and then the, the whole thing lives inside a water tank. And again, this is all 4,850 feet below the surface of the Earth. All right, so why a xenon time projection chamber? <clears throat> so the basics of LZ, is you have a right cylinder filled with, in our case, about seven tons of xenon. Um, and what happens is that there's an incoming particle interacts somewhere in the detector. You create a flash of light that is called S1. Um, and then you, you create some charge. We apply an electric field at top and bottom of this detector to drift that charge to the surface of the liquid where it's extracted into the gas and you get a second flash of light that we call S2. So a typical event has a small pulse of S1 followed sometime later by a bigger pulse of S2. And a really nice feature about these experiments is that you can get full 3D position reconstruction. So you get Z from the timing between the S1 and the S2, and you get XY from the position of the light pattern of the S2 light. And the reason why this is important is that xenon is dense. So xenon in liquid form is, simply, is roughly three kilograms per liter. That's denser than aluminum. And that means that radioactivity, which you, know, you're, you have to hold your detector in something, so all of that material is radioactive, but that, that material will range out in the outside of the detector. So this is sort of showing you in graphical, very, very cartoon form, right? If you have a small detector, you have a lot of edge space and a, and a very small central region. But as your detector gets bigger, you can range out that radioactivity and leave a very, very clean central volume. And the second key point on this slide is that xenon is easily purified. So that central volume really is clean of most radioactivity. <clears throat> Another really nice feature of the xenon TPC is we collect these two types of signals, right? We have the, the initial scintillation light, and then we collect the charge in the form of S2. And it turns out that this charge to light ratio gives us signal versus background discrimination. And this is really key because electrons and gammas, which make one of our biggest background components, interact primarily with atomic electrons. So in this case, it's this green line comes in and bangs off of an electron and, and recoils. And that makes an electron recoil, whereas WIMPs, as well as some backgrounds like neutrons, will interact with the nucleus. And so those produce nuclear recoils. And so the charge to light ratio gives us information about what type of recoil occurred, which lets us pull out the signal, the nuclear recoil, from the background, the electron recoil. <clears throat> so a few design notes of the LZTPC itself. <clears throat> it's about one and a half meters in diameter, one and a half meters in height. Again, it's roughly seven tons of active liquid xenon. We coat everything with Teflon because that improves our light collection. That light is collected by 494 three inch PMTs and arrays at top and bottom. Then there are four grids which set the high voltage so that we can do the drifting of the charge as I mentioned on the previous slide. But that's not all that LZ is. LZ really has two other detector systems as well, which are the veto detectors. And this goes back to the point from the beginning that WIMPs will only scatter once. Recall that it takes 10 million light years of lead to expect even one scatter at the, at the cross sections we're probing. Whereas backgrounds can and will scatter multiple times and that allows them to be vetoed. And so we have the xenon skin, which is two tons of liquid xenon surrounding the TPC, also instrumented with PMTs and Teflon. And that serves as an anti-coincidence detector primarily for gamma rays. And then very importantly is the outer detector, which is loaded with 17 tons of gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator in acrylic vessels. And the gadolinium is a really great neutron capture material. <clears throat> so neutrons, which are a particularly important background for us because they do make nuclear recoils just like WIMPs do. Um, but a neutron in this case will say, come off of a PMT material, scatter in the detector and make a nuclear recoil, but then get captured in the outer detector where it releases eight MeV worth of gamma rays. And those gamma rays light up the scintillator and we can see that and, and veto that event. <clears throat> so, what these vetoes let us do is characterize the backgrounds in situ, measure our neutron flux in situ explicitly of our experiment, and that really enables the discovery potential of LZ. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the background sources. There are many sources of backgrounds, and there are many methods for mitigating those backgrounds. 
In particular, the detector itself, as I keep mentioning, you know, any material you make has radioactivity in it. So nothing in our detector went into the detector, sorry, nothing went into the detector without being screened to make sure that everything was as pure as we could possibly make it. So there was a radioassay campaign. We had a number of germanium detectors, two of which are located here, uh, two of is pictured here from the SURF uh, Buck campus. We used ICPMS, we used neutron activation analysis, we used radon emanation. All of these things come together over thousands and thousands of assays to make the cryostat and the detector the most radio pure place we can make it in the world. For example, the cryostat in particular was made of radio pure titanium. We worry a lot about radon and radon daughters and dust, and you'll hear more about that later. The TPC was assembled in a radon reduced clean room, and we had standards where we wanted less than 500 nanograms per centimeter squared of dust on all xenon wetted surfaces, eliminating play down on the TPC walls. Then xenon contaminants are also an important object for us. So there's charcoal chromatography at SLAC, which I'll mention briefly again later, and there was continu pur continuous purification underground uh, at the site. So let's, let's get into the picture round, which I think is my favorite part of the talk until we get to the end. So detector assembly began in earnest in the fall of 2018 on the surface at SURF, uh, something like 13,000 hours in this low rate on clean room where tens of thousands of ultra clean low background components came together. The TPC itself was brought underground in October of 2019 and the cryostat was closed up in March 2020 ahead of the COVID-19 shutdowns. The OD was complete and filled a year later by July. Xenon offsite purification was complete in August, and then we filled the TPC in September of 2021. And here is a very busy timeline of some of the activities there. So let's go through some pictures. So here are the PMT arrays that live at top and bottom of our detector, uh, and we're coupled with 11.6 miles of low background dust-free cabling. Um, and you can see again the, the clean room environment that this was put together in. <clears throat> this is a picture of the skin. Um, so Teflon is good for reflecting light, and so we coat everything with Teflon. Um, this is to allow us to collect the light that's uh, emitted in the skin. The grids were weaved in a custom built loom. Uh, this is really cool. They actually made a loom to, grit, to weave our grids in a clean room at Slack. Major QA program to make sure that this was mechanical and electrically resilient and, and again, super clean. Here's pictures of the central TPC assembly. <coughs> uh, the central TPC took place in December of 2020, I think 2020, sorry, 2019. Um, and then starting to mate the grids together. Here's the final mating of the top part of the detector, what we call the extraction region with the central TPC. And here's the final experiment, uh, the final TPC put together, a very beautiful device, again, still on the surface. So you see, again, all the Teflon, which is for reflectivity. Um, at the bottom and the top, you see arrays of photomultipliers. And then actually here you see an array of the skin photomultiplier tubes, which look down into what we call the barrel system. And it was still clean. So we achieved our targets of that very, very, very low loading of dust. Um, and we know that because we did assays and looked under UV lights and we're very, very careful all the way through. So then the TPC was inserted into our ultra pure cryostat and brought underground. Um, and this happened in October of 2019. Uh, this is what the definition of a critical lift is, I believe. Um, but it made it safely um, and everything was brought underground at the end of 2019. Here is the inner cryostat being loaded in the IO cryostat. And then the final connections were made in March of 2020. <clears throat> Let's go take a so quick detour through the outer detector. Um, so here is one of um, four large side tanks, 12 feet tall. These are acrylic tanks made by the same people who make the, uh, the swimming pools and fish tanks that are on the tops of hotels and fancy places in, uh, in Europe and Asia um, with our postdoc uh, soon to be faculty, Sally Shaw. Uh, she was able to choose the, the color of the transport fixture. So the hot pink transfer fixture. I love this picture of the outer detector coming into the, uh, the water tank. And then here's the outer detector system put together around the central cryostat. <clears throat> we then installed the PMTs that look at the outer detector. And then finally, the outer detector itself is also a beautiful system, right? This is looking up at the Tyvek coded again for light collection um, at the, the acrylic tanks of the outer detector. Uh, we would be remiss not to mention the many, many, many cables that go out to reading out our electronics. Um, so we have something like 1,400 channels of readout, um, which are brought together in electronics DAC system. There's a circula xenon circulation. So we designed the system to circulate at 500 liters per minute to turn over the full xenon mass every few days. We had an underground commissioning test in July 2021 that demonstrated that we could achieve that rate. And this purification uses a hot zirconium getter to remove non-noble impurities from the system. I mentioned briefly krypton removal. So krypton is a background that lives in the xenon. It's difficult to remove it. 
So we had a dedicated cross chromatography system in this giant uh, platform at Slack to remove Krypton from Xenon. And in the end, we reduced it to something like 100 parts per quadrillion gram per gram of Krypton and Xenon. This was a major operation in, in the first half of 2021 and a huge effort from the team um, at Slack and with support from other people around the collaboration. Um, I mentioned the data acquisition. So we have a triggered data acquisition with zero suppression, um, with event selection from digital filters running on an FPGA, 32 channel digitizers and logic boards designed by the Skutek instrumentation group. Um, custom firmware and software was developed within the collaboration. And we have real time monitoring using a suite of tools, including an online scope. And during our WIMP search, we had a lifetime of 97%, which was quite nice. Our offline computing is also a critical part of the experiment. How do we handle all this data we collect and, and, and analyze? We have two data centers, one located in the US at the nurse facility and one in the UK data center that's centered on the grid PP facility. <clears throat> These are fully redundant. Each site can run processing and simulation. We're transporting data back and forth. All detected data are processed automatically 24 seven and we can reprocess on demand as needed. Um, and I think it's interesting that both NERSC and GridPP have diverging CPU architectures, um, but our software can run seamlessly in either version. And we've been developing expertise in both, uh, in both types of computing. All right, so um, before I turn it over to Aaron, I'll just have one or two slides on commissioning. So the TPC detector was filled and leveled from August through September. And then we biased our grids. <clears throat> we extract, uh, established extraction drift fields uh, in October and then made some changes in December. So our first light and charge came on October 6th. And by the end of this process, we had a drift field of 190 volts per centimeter. That's 32 kilovolts in the cathode and an extraction field of about 7.3 kilovolts per centimeter in the gas phase. Uh, that's eight kilovolts between the gate and the anode. And this is a picture of our first event that we recorded um, in October 6th. Um, we operate and characterize our PMTs during this period, <clears throat> um, taking LEDs and gain matching. Um, some of the PMTs were turned off very early on because of noise or other poor connections, um, but overall our, our um, survival rate for PMTs is quite high. Um, we fully exercised our data processing chain. Uh, we tuned our data acquisition and trigger. So the S2 trigger efficiency, we trigger on the S2 signal because it's the nice big signal. Um, and so that's fully efficient at 600 photo photons detected, which is roughly equal to six electrons. And then we uh, completed a set of initial calibrations primarily in November um, to provide us position corrections for light collection, our reconstruction and uh, calibrations in the outer detector. <clears throat> so our first science run, our initial plan was to take 60 live days. And this we decided on to sort of be able to prove that the detector was working well. And because we had an expectation that that would provide competitive sensitivity to existing results. So we took data from December 23rd to May 12th with a break for calibrations in the middle and at the end. And sort of interestingly enough, we sort of aligned on the holiday calendar. So we started on December 23rd, which was a nice Christmas present for everybody in the collaboration that they could finally take a, a breather. Um, we had a pause for calibrations actually around Martin Luther King Day. Uh, we completed our SR1 WIMP search on April 18th, just after Easter, and took another calibration campaign. And I'm speaking to you today on July 7th, a few days after the July 4th holiday in the US. So with that, I think it's time to talk about data analysis. Uh, and let's look at some waveforms, which is a mantra within LZ, uh, something you can actually get on a t-shirt if you wish at our store. And the link to the store is down below if you're interested. So over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Hugh. Um, okay, so Hugh took us through the design and construction of the LZ experiment, the three detectors, what we're looking for, how we're looking for that. He took us through a timeline of uh, the, the commissioning of LZ, and finally, the first science run of LZ. And so I'm going to take us through what we do with that data, how we've analyzed that, and what we've uh, learned with respect to dark matter from those data. OK, just to recap, uh, this is this uh, cartoon, again, of the uh, LZ-TPC, just to reiterate what happens when a particle comes in and deposits energy. There's an initial flash of light that we call S1. And then sometime later, there is a flash of light after the electrons drift to the surface um, that we call S2. And the two signals are delayed because it takes some time for the electrons to reach the liquid surface. Um, what that means is that we can use that delay time to understand what the depth of the event was. Okay. And Hugh also described how we can use the proportion of S1 and S2 to learn whether uh, an event was caused by an electronic recoil or a nuclear recoil. And that's important because our background is mostly from electronic recoils while the signal we're looking for is uh, nuclear recoils. 
Okay, so the maximum drift time uh, that we have here from events at the very bottom of the detector is about one millisecond. Okay, so we have uh, photomultiplier tubes instrumented at the top and bottom, which look at this light, and a characteristic signal that uh, Hugh uh, uh, alluded to earlier uh, that comes from these photo, uh, photo sensors is an S1 of about a few hundred nanoseconds in, in width, followed some time by an S2 of about a, a microsecond in width. Okay, this is a cartoon version of that. Uh, in reality, a, a waveform looks something like this. Here's the S1, here's the S2. It's a little hard to see because we're so zoomed out. You also notice that there's a few other pulses peppered throughout the event record. Those will be something we'll talk about later. Okay, well, as we mentioned, what we're looking for is an anomalous source of nuclear recoils. And we have background that are electronic recoils. So we better be able to understand how our detector responds to electronic and nuclear recoils. And so to do that, we have a very rich campaign of calibrations. So what you can see here is a wall of text that I'm not gonna go through uh, all, uh, completely. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight the, the main calibration sources that we utilize in LZ. So we need uh, to be able to generate nuclear recoils. And to do that, we use neutron sources. We have a few of those, two of them I've listed here. One is a deuterium, deuterium fusion neutron generator. It produces a monoenergetic source of two and a half MeV neutrons that we collimate into a beam. We use this to define our nuclear recoil response. We use it to measure our trigger efficiency, uh, some cut acceptances that I'll talk about later. We also have an americium lithium source is an alpha N uh, uh, source that produces uh, neutrons of continuum energy. Isotropically, we use this to calibrate our outer detector that, that you mentioned, also to measure the tagging efficiency of the outer detector for nuclear recoils and also some other cut acceptances. And the last one I want to talk about is uh, a source that we've used previously in the LUX experiment, uh, which is tritium. Uh, chemically, it's, it's methane. Uh, it, that contains a tritium uh, atom. Tritium is a beta emitter. It emits um, betas with a continuum energy up to about eight and a half keV. And this uh, is used to define our electronic recoil band, to measure our fiducial volume, and uh, also measure some, <coughs> excuse me, cut acceptances. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we can do with the calibration sources is that we can measure the purity of the liquid xenon, specifically. Uh, from the perspective of electronegative impurities. So we've mentioned that we need to drift electrons through the liquid xenon. An electronegative impurity like oxygen tends to trap electrons. And we quantify that purity with a, with a parameter known as the electron lifetime. This measures the average amount of time that a free electron will live in the liquid xenon uh, before it's trapped by an oxygen molecule. Um, now, our requirement from the design phase of LZ was that our, our electron lifetime must be above one millisecond. And that, if you remember, is the maximum drift time in our experiment. Uh, but in, in fact, we actually had much better purity than that. We started off at about five milliseconds, extending up to uh, almost eight. There was a, an event in March in which we lost circulation, but we quickly recovered from that. And, and got back up to our, our high point in, in purity. And I'll mention something about what uh, impact this, uh, this circulation change had on our uh, wind sensitivity. Okay, okay. so uh, Hugh mentioned that uh, we distinguish electronic recoils from nuclear recoils based on the proportion of our two measured signals, S1 and S2. And this parameter space that we're showing here is one that we'll get used to because we'll see this repeated several times. This is the log of the S2 signal versus the S1 signal. The blue points are from our tritium calibration. These are electronic recoils. The orange points are from our DD neutron calibration or nuclear recoils. And you can see that they're separated. Um, now, one important feature is that what we expect to see in a WIMP search is backgrounds, mainly electronic recoils in this blue band. And if there are WIMPs, then we expect to see an anomalous source of events in this red band, or it will be empty if there are no WIMPs. Okay, but you notice that the two populations do overlap. And so if we wanna be able to make statistical statements about whether or not there are extra nuclear recoils in a data set, uh, we need to understand the fluctuations of these blue points very well. And one of the nice things about tritium is it allows us to validate and measure our e, uh, electronic le uh, recoil leakage out to four standard deviations uh, below the median of, of this band. Okay. And it also allows us to measure some parameters of the detector, like the photon detection efficiency, extraction efficiency, uh, things like that. Okay. So if we take a look at the science run one data in this parameter space, what do we see? This is 
plotting all of the data, no cuts of any kind. We're showing the dirty laundry here. Um, we see the electronic recoil band. It may be hard to see uh, in blue and in red, the nuclear recoil band. So are there wimps in there? Uh, well, it's hard to see. Well, we've made no cuts of any kind. One of the first cuts we can do is to apply a fiducial volume cut where we remove events that occur near the edge of the detector. Um, and uh, what happens when you do that is it cleans up the, the, the plot quite a bit. Uh, in this case, our fiducial mass, which we've measured again, is five and a half tons of liquid xenon. Well, there's still quite a bit of, of messy events in here, uh, and it's hard to make statements about WIMPs. So one of the things that we've had to do, and also previous experiments, and every experiment has to do, is to pay a lot of attention to data quality and understanding when an event really is a, a valid event and when it really is a spurious signal. Okay. So we have two sets of data quality cuts. Uh, one is based on uh, events and pulses that target the shape of the S1 pulses and the shape of the S2 pulses and hit patterns. Uh, the impact of these cuts is they uh, have an effect on our signal acceptance uh, that we measure with calibrations. There's a second category of cuts that we call time period cuts, uh, where we remove periods of lifetime when the detector is maybe not in a very quiet or quiescent state. And then this impacts the, the overall lifetime. And I'll talk uh, about these uh, after uh, mentioning a few things about the pulse-based cuts. So the pulse-based cuts, we don't have time to go through all of them, um, but uh, uh, we, um, I think I, yeah. So they, they are targeted on the S1 and S2 shapes, um, and we measure their acceptances with, with calibration data. Um, and all told, with, with what we've measured, uh, we're able to measure the detection efficiency for nuclear recoils of a given energy, which we've shown here in this efficiency curve. Uh, we reach uh, around 90% at the plateau here in the middle of our energy range of interest, um, and we cross the 50% detection efficiency level at about 5.3 keV nuclear recoil equivalent. Um, now, compare this with our design requirement, which was that we should have 50% efficiency at 6 keV, so we're doing a little bit better than that. Okay, so why do we have um, cuts based on the time periods? Well, one of the things we notice is that when we have an event where there's a large S2, following that S2 for quite a long time, there's a lot of detector activity, such as single electrons that get uh, emitted from the liquid surface, single photoelectrons uh, that we see in the PMTs that extend for quite a long time, much longer than one event window, okay? And so we call these things electron trains or photon trains, and we need to be able to uh, 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 remove these time periods so that they don't contaminate our uh, data stream uh, when we're looking for a very rare event like a, like a WIMP interaction. So let me give you a sense of what that looks like. This plot here, uh, I'll walk you through it. This is a snapshot of five seconds of our, of our science run one data. Okay, the red do dots indicate the location and time and the size of a large S2. And then the blue histogram shows you the rate of single photons uh, observed in our photomultiplier tubes. And you see that whenever there's a large S2, there's a spike in that rate of photons that decays away with the power law and takes some time. Keep in mind, these, are, these ticks are at seconds. So some fractions of a second after every single event um, where, where the detector is in a very active state. And this is, we showed you a couple uh, examples of good uh, uh, waveforms from uh, events. This is an example of what would uh, uh, the, the waveforms coming from one of these gray periods looks like. And so we spent some time uh, optimizing how to remove these periods following a large S2, following a large event, uh, with, with a, train, a cut that we call uh, electron and photon train cuts um, to remove events, events like this. Now, you notice that in these five seconds, a large fraction of the time is gray. And in fact, this cut that we uh, apply when we exclude any, any region in gray, um, it's very effective at cleaning up our data, but at the expense it, that it removes about 30% of our lifetime. This is not the only thing, not only pull, uh, cut that we use that removes lifetime. There are a number of other ones that I've listed here, but this electron photon train holdoff cut um, is the one that impacts our lifetime the most. It removes, as I said, about 30% of lifetime. We have a few others that have smaller impact. For example, when a muon goes through, uh, it, it rings the detector for tens of seconds, and we have to exclude those, those time periods as well. But fortunately, new ones are quite rare in our, in our experiment. Okay, so how do we quantify our lifetime? Well, uh, as a function of calendar time here, we have the total accumulated lifetime in blue, 
before any cuts. And then when we apply all our cuts, this orange dash curve is what we get. We had two stoppages in lifetime collection, one when we had our DD calibration, and then later on when we had that circulation drop that I, I mentioned earlier. And in total, we have about 60 live days, 60.3 live days uh, of data collected. Okay. Okay, so Hugh mentioned a few things about backgrounds and I have another wall of text here. I'm not gonna talk through everything. Our main background in our experiment comes from lead 214. This is a beta emitter dissolved in the liquid xenon. It's a radon 222 daughter. Radon 222 is a, is a, is a, a noble gas, so it kind of gets everywhere in our detector. Uh, we also have a few others that I'll talk about later on. Um, but as I said, radon, lead 214, this is our, our main background. And so how we quantify this is that we, we take a look at our mid-range energy data in the few hundred keV range where we have a few activation peaks and we fit this with our background model and we uh, derive that our, our rate, lead 214 rate is about three and a quarter microbecquerel per kilogram of liquid xenon. Now we can have a, some checks, cross checks to see if that makes sense. Here's the decay scheme of radon 222 from uh, radon down to stable lead. Um, looking at these uh, uh, decays is a lot uh, different because these are alpha decays, but as we see that any lead 214 came from a rate right on 222. So the rate of lead 214 must be strictly less than or equal to the rate of, of rate on 222. And then the next alpha down the chain that we see is polonium 214. Again, this rate must be uh, strictly less than or equal to the rate of, of lead 214. So we've also shown here our measured rates of rate on 222. Uh, and measured rates of polonium 214, and indeed they, they bracket our, our estimate of radon in, in the uh, fiducial volume. Okay, so I mentioned uh, briefly argon 37. This is a uh, an electron capture source that gets produced uh, cosmically. It exists in the atmosphere at an equilibrium value ranging from one to 100 millibecquerels per cubic meter. It's also produced in our xenon while it was on the surface as a result of cosmic spallation. Um, uh, we published a paper not too long ago uh, predicting what our rates were based on our exposure of the xenon when it was on the surface. Uh, and we expect uh, something like 100 decays of argon-37 in our SR1 data with a large uncertainty, and that uncertainty mostly comes from uncertainty in the cosmic spallation cross-section. This is that parameter space I've shown you again, uh, log 10 of S2 versus S1. And this is what an argon-37, it's a monoenergetic peak, this is what it would look like in our data. Okay. Okay, we have an, uh, another background called at the accidentals background. Uh, I won't spend too much time in the slide because we don't have too much time, but basically there are processes that produce S1. There are processes that produce S2s that are unrelated. Once in a while, though, uh, one of those S1s can accidentally coincide with an S2 and look like a, um, a valid event. Okay, and so we call these accidental coincidences. We have a very powerful sideband for measuring the rates of these. Uh, and I won't dwell on this, but if there's questions, I have more slides on it. But in, in essence, with uh, a lot of our quality cuts that I mentioned before, we uh, are able to bring this, this rate down to an estimated number of 1.2 events in our science run one data of accidental coincidences. Um, so finally, the last uh, uh, background I wanna talk about, it's one of the, the, the rarest backgrounds that we have, but probably the most important in terms of uh, prospect of measuring uh, uh, WIMPs. And that is uh, from, from neutrons. Um, we, we have this outer detector that, that Hugh mentioned, we're able to tag whenever it looks like there's a neutron that was captured in the outer detector. The outer detector itself has a background. This is the spectrum of energy depositions in the outer detector. Cyan, it might be a little hard to see, is the background spectrum when we expose it to neutrons from a calibration source, you see the gamma cascades out to about eight and a half MeV. Okay. So, uh, our tag of neutrons, we're able to measure its, its efficacy. Uh, and we find that when there's a single scatter nuclear recoil in the xenon TPC, we have about an 88 and a half percent probability of detecting it with our outer detector. Now the outer detector does have background. So sometimes we'll get signals, tagging signals, and uh, that hits at, uh, our lifetime at about 5%. Okay, so how do we use that? Well, what we can do is we can take our WIMP search data and look at just those events which fail the veto cut. So these, these is events from SR1, which pass all cuts except for they had a coincident uh, OD tagging veto. And we can fit these data with our background model and the nuclear recoil model. 
uh, to extract a data-driven constraint on our uh, rate of nuclear recoils in the WIMP search. And it places uh, a one sigma constraint of, of less than 0.2 events in our, in our science run one data set. Um, and uh, uh, we apply this, this constraint function that we derive to our final um, analysis. Now this is consistent with what we expected uh, based on simulations. Okay. So, okay, so putting all our backgrounds together in this data set again, what do we expect to see? Well, uh, what the backgrounds are, are shown here, the distribution in gray, we've highlighted sort of the argon 37. There's also another bump from xenon 127, which we didn't mention. Okay, here uh, we have our pre-fit values here, expected rates. Um, a, a WIMP of 30 GeV would, would produce events falling in this contour here, given by the purple dashed lines. We didn't mention much about boron-8 neutrinos, but with our thresholds and cuts, we don't expect many of those, just about 0.15 events in science run one. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, so this is the data, this is what the data set will be falling into. Uh, this is our expectation of what, uh, where the, the points will follow, will fall. And so what does it look like when we actually plot the data in here? And this is, this is it. So these black points are the 335 events from our science run one data that pass all our cuts, pass our selections. Um, we see uh, the contour of argon 37 here, and indeed there's an excess of events there. Um, and same thing with xenon-127. We see uh, no events in the low energy region of the nuclear recoil band. We have some leakage here, which is quasi consistent with our, our uh, estimates from our, our electronic recoil model. Um, again, this is 60.3 live days, 5.5 tons, okay. Um, so, uh, so how do those events look like distributed in the detector? They're pretty uniform. The black points here are those, uh, those 335 events in our, uh, our position coordinates of drift time, which is the depth of the event and reconstructed radius. What we've shown here, blue circles are events that would have been in that data set, but they were tagged by the outer detector, the neutron tag. And again, 5% of our background should be in there. Uh, red events are things that were tagged by our xenon skin, which are sort of mostly a, a gamma veto, okay? So these events, as I said, are, are distributed mostly, uh, mostly uniformly in the detector. Okay, if, I, if we can reconstruct the energy of each event, we can plot the histogram here of, of, the, uh, of the background data. That's the black circles of the histogram. The blue is our best fit of our, of our uh, background model. You see a big peak from argon 37. There's a smaller peak from xenon 127 and the rest of it dominated by uh, dissolved uh, continuum beta decays. Okay, with a plot like this, we're able to do a statistical analysis of it, a goodness of fit. And we find that with no WIMP signal, we have a p-value of 0.96, which is a little high, but it certainly indicates that we have a good uh, match to our data. Okay. Um, and so uh, this, this best fit has also allowed us to, to uh, tell, you know, how, how well is the, um, was, our, was our expectation on the background events. Uh, most of these, uh, of these constraints on these background sources are consistent with, with the expected rates. Um, argon 37, as I mentioned, we had a large uncertainty in that, so we put a, a uniform uh, uh, constraint function on that, uh, and uh, we back out about uh, 50 events in, in this science run one data set. Um, okay, so with that, I want to just sort of wrap up what we've learned. So our top priority with science run one was to debut the LZ experiment and to demonstrate that it's performing according to expectations. We have done that. All three LZ detectors are performing well. Our backgrounds are within expectations. And our conclusions are that all systems are go for our full data set, which we plan to be 1,000 live days. However, we can use these data to say something about dark matter. And I'll hand it over back to Hugh to walk through the, uh, the results that we get when we try to uh, look for dark matter with these data. Thanks, Aaron, for setting me up. We had a we had a long discussion about who would actually get to present the results, and I won the paper rock scissors competition <laughs> um, because rock always beats scissors. <clears throat> so, uh, one slide before we get to the end. Um, how do we actually set a or do a result? <clears throat> we use a statistical um, study, a PLR test statistic. Um, there was actually a paper that came out recently where all the members of the dark matter community came together to agree on the right way to actually apply this, um, this procedure. And so we followed that recommendation. Um, these are the parameters if you're interested. 
Um, but this is this is what we do to turn. A, what we do is we take this data set, in fact, in this space, in this S2 versus S1C space, and we hand it to the fitter to tell us how many wimps could be hiding in this uh, in this space. And the results, of course, is that we have no evidence for wimps at any mass in this space. You might have been able to tell that based on uh, the previous slide. Um, here, the curve, the solid black line is our observed limit. Um, the dashed black line is our median sensitivity, given the backgrounds that we expected. Um, so this is where you would have, you know, on average would have uh, showed up. And then the black line is where we do show up. The minimum exclusion is at 6 times 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared at 30 Jev. Um, so that is now crossing yet another order of magnitude in this cross section. Um, it's about a factor of 6.7 times improvement um, at that 30 Jev point and something like a factor of 1.7 improvement um, in the flat part up at the top. Um, I do want to mention that there is a power constraint. So if you look closely, you'll see these bands here represent one and two sigma fluctuations on what we might expect from this median sensitivity. And in this sort of 10 to 20 to 30 region, we are power constraining according to the recommendations of this paper. Um, and we can talk more about that in the, in the questions if you like. <clears throat> I think it's worth noting that the this dot dash line here is the sensitivity um, where a median, sorry, if, if WIMPs lived on this line, you would have three sigma evidence in your median discovery or in your median experiment. So we sort of managed to get the right amount of time in SR1 where we might have had an expectation of discovering something if WIMPs were just beyond the, the previous best limits, which were coming from the Panda X and Xenon experiments. Um, so that's an interesting feature of this result. All right, so what next? Um, Aaron mentioned it, but LZ plans to take 1,000 live days of data. So that's a factor of 17 more exposure. Um, and so there's a more than an order of magnitude in exposure where WIMPs could still be hiding um, as we actually go into our full sort of science program. And there's lots of science to do in addition to the primary dark matter search. Um, we can look for effective field theory couplings for dark matter. Um, we can look for electronic recoil signatures. Um, for example, a, a very interesting paper that came out in the last few years was from Xenon 1 ton, where they had a small excess at low energy. Um, and we will have, have sensitivity to that excess as well. And we can do low mass dark matter searches. We can look for different types of dark matter. We'll have sensitivity to neutrinos double beta decay, rare decays of xenon isotopes, and much more. Some of these sensitivities are described in the papers uh, shown here. Um, so there's a lot of science to do with LZ now that we've established um, that the detector is running well. But beyond that, I think it's important to highlight that dark matter remains one of the biggest mysteries in particle physics today. So going back to the P5 particle physics planning back in 2013, 2014, identifying the new physics of dark matter was a top priority. We have not yet done this, so it remains a top priority. And in fact, in the SNOMAS process currently ongoing, um, where we're sort of re redoing this planning, uh, planning for particle physics, dark matter was the most commonly mentioned topic in all of the SNOMAS uh, letters of intent, leverage of interest. <clears throat> so it remains obviously extremely high priority for us in the particle physics community. And to that end, I think it's worth noting that there are several collaborations around the world building detectors like LZ. The Xenon technology has proven to be extremely successful in doing this type of dark matter search um, and so it's a, it's a really good technology to pursue. And we have decided to join with our competition, uh, our friendly competitors in the Xenon and Darwin uh, collaborations uh, to make the XLZD consortium. Um, we actually had a meeting about a week and a half ago in, at Karlsruhe hosted by um, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which was a lovely meeting. Um, there's been a, a, a website that is now uh, linked from this page and a white paper came out as sort of leading up to the SNOMAS that just details all of the possible science we can do. Um, and so we're uniting to try and build uh, one more version of this experiment. Um, the science case is very, very strong. Um, all of the things we can do in LZ, you can do even better in a larger experiment. So that includes dark matter and, and WIMP dark matter in particular. But we have great sensitivity to neutrinos from the sun, from supernovae. Um, double beta decay, of course, remains an interesting target in cosmic rays. So the type of things you can do with such an experiment is, uh, is myriad. And so finally, our outlook. LZ is online. It's taking high quality physics data. All the detectors are performing well, and our backgrounds are within expectation. After this 60 live day run, LZ is the most sensitive dark matter detector in the world. A paper is available online at our website shortly following this presentation. We'll also post the slides from this presentation, and we hope to submit that to the archive today, uh, so it'll be available on the archive tomorrow. And then for the next sort of generation, or after we think about the, the next steps, the Xenon community is uniting into the XLZD or the XLZD consortium to build one more Xenon experiment to rule them all. 
And this is, will be a multi-purpose observatory with huge physics potential. So I think the future is really bright for this type of technology and for LZ in particular. I want to once again thank our sponsors and our participating institutions, particularly the DOE, Office of Science, who are really, really supportive of us all through the project and operations phases. Um, the STFC in the UK was a, a, a great support. Um, the FCT in Portugal, the Institute for Basic Science in South Korea, and of course, Sanford Underground Research Facility for hosting our experiment, and providing uh, tremendous technical support during the whole uh, construction and assembly. And then lastly, I want to thank the members of LZ uh, itself. Um, being, you know, working on this result for the last several months has been the honor of my professional career. Um, I really, really appreciate everybody who put in their heart and soul to build this experiment, starting back in 2014 through design, through construction, through the very, very crazy uh, commissioning phases when we were working 13 hour shifts because of the cage situation. Um, I just, it's, it's really been a pleasure for me to work with all of you. And so I wanna thank the LC collaboration tremendously for all of their efforts. Um, and with that, we will stop. Thank you. Uh, I think we can take some questions. So, yeah, I see some, some questions already in the Q&A. Um, do we want to maybe take uh, some raised hands first? Oh, OK. Well, let's, uh, let's take that. Can't hear. Uh, I think we're looking. For, Maybe we'll. Let, let, yeah, let's answer another question. We'll yeah. figure out the hands. Okay. So we have. Okay, Caleb, please. Maybe we should go to the Q and A while we figure that out. Apologies, Caleb. We're having some audio issues. Um, Okay, so there's two questions about S2s. Uh, why do only large S2s induce pulse trains? And then the second part, which is associated with, was the largest S2 afterglow cut anticipated in the experiment? Um, it looks like multiple hertz of big S2 events. Where do those come from? Um, Aaron, do you wanna answer? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's not just large S2s. It's, it's actually that we noticed that the trains come as a function of the S2 size. And so the hold off that we impose, which is in software, the hold off, duration is a function of the S2 size. And then yes, the, the S2 afterglow is something, it's something we, we've seen in, in Lux, we've seen in Zeppelin, Xenon uh, one ton saw it, um, pretty much every single liquid Xenon detector for dark matter that's operated so far has seen this. Um, so it, it is an expected thing. Of course, you know the exact parameters are hard to predict, uh, but uh, we were expecting this. Maybe I'll add two more comments to that. The, the multiple hertz of big S2 events, I mean, that's just from you know, ambient radioactivity, yeah. um, radon. You know, we, we see a very small number of radon events in our region of interest, but of course the radon chain has much, much higher energy depositions and those are, are going off all the time. Um, and also external gamma rays, which also do not end up affecting our final WIMP search, but they're, they're there. Um, and so that few hertz is, you know, is really the background uh, field that we're seeing. Um, and then I think the other thing I might, might want to say is, you know, this 30% this, uh, of lifetime loss, um, we, this will be the optimistic version of what I'm about to say. Uh, the analysis really needed that cut to proceed in the, in the first place um, because there's just so much stuff in those chain trains as, as Aaron showed. So that was sort of the first cut that we really developed. And I think there's room for optimization now that we've understood the detector more. So I hope in the future that we'll do better than that 30% cut. Okay, me. Um, all right, Caleb, if you are there. Fingers crossed. Okay, Caleb has put his question into the Q&A. Uh, why couldn't you just go to the 10 to the minus 47 and break that barrier while keeping under the limit? Um, so I, I think an answer to that question is just that, you know, the limit, the final result is what the data tells us. Um, and so when you run your statistical analysis on, on where the dark matter could live in such a way that you would not have been sensitive to it, that's the line that we draw. So breaking the 10 to the minus 47 square centimeter barriers is actually an amazing feat, I think. It just shows how sensitive the experiment is. Um, okay, so we have maybe anonymous attendee. Uh, what causes the general shape of the limit curve on the slide 67? Maybe we should uh, go back. Go back. Where, I'll let you do it. It's your computer. Uh -oh. Always dangerous. Uh, 
did we close it? Mm. We may have closed it. Oh, because it's full screen, maybe. Okay, I have to get out of <laughs> classic. Um, search. Escape. So maybe while I was doing that, I did notice one question about blinding. Did we do a blind analysis? So this is a, an interesting topic. We actually spent quite a bit of time discussing this within LZ and also in the pre predecessor experiment Lux. Um, the first results of an experiment, when you're turning on a brand new detector, you, as you saw, we have, we have to do a lot of data quality uh, efforts. And uh, we felt that a, a blind analysis for our first results is not appropriate. Uh, and, the, and the reason there is because you know, experimenter bias is one thing that can drive uh, your measured result away from the true value, but there are a lot of other things that can do that as well. And so uh, we felt that, that the, the primary goal of this experiment was to make sure that we understood the response, that we have an understanding of, of how to clean up the data and blinding really would hurt, hurt that effort. And uh, we do uh, intend to not blind, but salt the data. This is where you sprinkle in fake, um, fake signals in future runs. But for this first run, we had decided uh, a blind analysis is not appropriate, uh, though we did take efforts to try to minimize our experimenter bias by tuning cuts only on calibrations, uh, et cetera. So, um, All right, I'll take a stab at this question. So what, is, what causes the shape of the limit curves on slide 67? Um, so the, all, all the limit curves often have this sort of reclining lounge chair shape. Um, and effectively, what's driving that is are two things. So at the low side, um, it's the energy threshold. So I, I, we didn't have time to dwell on the sort of the, the physics or the, the expectation of what goes in here. But what's going on is that you need to have some minimum energy deposited in the detector to be visible. Um, and light dark matter has a hard time depositing that amount of energy because of kinematics effectively, right? So imagine a very, very light thing hitting this big bowling ball of a xenon nucleus. It's hard to give it a big kick. So at low mass, you just don't get enough energy deposition. And so our energy threshold drives the sharp rise at the low masses. If you're looking very, very carefully, you'll see that we, we stopped drawing the line at nine GeV. That was a conservative choice on our part because uh, we wanted to make sure that we really understood all of the details of the low energy threshold response before we, you know, we tried to say something st strong about that. So that's what's driving the low side. On the high side, this effectively runs out linearly out to as far as you want to draw it. And that's because of uh, density. So the rate of dark matter interactions in our experiment is going to be proportional to the number of dark matter particles passing through our experiment. Um, the thing that we know from astrophysics is the density of dark matter, which means that the heavier the dark matter is, the fewer particles there are. And so that's why this is linearly uh, going out at the high side. Um, and the, the last second part of that question was about nuclear physics. This is for a spin independent interaction where we have sort of deliberately tried to not delve too much into the nuclear physics. Um, uh, so I think this particular uh, plot would not be too much affected by different understanding of nuclear physics, but there are other types of interactions that we can talk about that would, and we're not showing those today. Okay, so uh, the next question is about the xenon one ton excess. We basically glossed over that. So I do wanna, we do have a slide uh, just to basically tell you that we're not gonna say anything. Let's see if I can find that slide. Yes, I got it. Oh, there it is, right. So, okay, so um, xenon one ton uh, presented uh, observation of an excess rate of electronic recoils that you see on the left plot here. This is from their paper. Uh, so uh, the obvious question is, can we say anything about it? And the answer is yes. Um, and what we see on the left, on the right side is, uh, is our data plotted in similar, in similar coordinates. Uh, and we do see a big spike that we attribute to argon 37. Now, uh, this is uh, consistent with the rate that we expected from argon-37 based on the known or the, the, uh, the cross sections for cosmic spallation. We do see that it decays away with the half-life expected for argon-37. And in fact, the time profile is inconsistent with uh, constant decay rate. Um, but uh, we don't want to say much more at the moment because what we want to do is do a proper statistical treatment of this and put a paper out that really examines the low energy electronic recoil signals here uh, that will make it, you know, examine the, the excess from xenon one ton to see if it's consistent with what we see. What can we say about that? What can we say about solar axions? That's one of the things that they looked at uh, and whatnot. But I will say that so, so far this bump that we do see 
is absolutely consistent with argon 37. And there was a follow-up question, I think, from Zheng Lai, which is how can there be argon 37? Well, the detector was moved underground, but we didn't fill it with xenon until later. So the, the xenon did spend time on the surface, even while the detector was underground. And again, this is consistent with our expected activation rate based on our knowledge of the history of the xenon and when it was on the surface. Yeah, if you remember my timeline that I flashed through very, very quickly, the xenon was purified of krypton, um, sort of roughly that completed in August. We were shipping it to site as we could, and then we sort of rushed it in the detector as fast as we could. But that means that the time difference between the last time the xenon was on the surface and the time we started SR1 was not actually very long. It was only a few months. Um, and so that's why the argon 37 stays there. Um, all right. It's a question about the XLZD timeline. I, I think it's too premature to really say much about that. Um, uh, so apologies, I don't know if you want to say anything more. Uh, no, I'm happy to not yeah. say more about that. That's, I think this XNL's background is interesting. But first of all, uh, so two, okay. uh, zero neutrino double beta decay. Um, so I think we, uh, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I actually cannot remember. We have a paper um, that is published on the archives that it, it explicitly goes through our sensitivity to double beta decay. So I recommend you look for that. And if maybe if you contact me, Afterwards, I can send you the reference. Um, let's talk about the sidebands for the accidental background. Oh, right. Okay. So let's go back to that. Um, you know, I did have to gloss over it. Um, okay. So um, I, can, oh, yeah. I can make it full screen. So what I was trying to convey with this, this cartoon is that um, we do have a maximum uh, allowed drift time of one millisecond. Those are events that are occur right at our cathode, uh, take uh, the maximum amount of time to get up to the liquid surface. However, in our data processing chain, we don't require that as a, as a, as a, you know, a, a characteristic of an event to be considered a single scatter. We do have quite a bit of pre-trigger window in our DAC, and we can see events up to uh, several milliseconds uh, after the, where, where the S2 follows several milliseconds after the S1. And so these events where we see like on the bottom, uh, um, oh yeah, use the cursor, uh, an S1 followed by an S2, our data processing framework will uh, say that looks like a single scatter. We easily uh, veto it because it's outside of our fiducial region, but these events are only coming from accidental coincidences. And so it's a sideband that allows us to estimate that rate. Now we actually, in constructing the, the 2D PDF that we can go to okay. a little bit, um, we, what we do is we actually grab isolated S1 pulses and isolated S2 pulses from the event records and bootstrap them into a data set that we can put through our data processing framework um, uh, so that they are um, subject to the same um, selections and, and cuts that we apply to the WIMP search. And from that uh, bootstrapped process data set, we generate this uh, 2D distribution of the expectation of, of where those uh, accidental coincidences live. But the sideband specifically that we're looking for is, is mainly this, this region where we have what we call unphysical drift, where the delay time between the S1 and the S2 is longer than what it could be for a physical event. Thanks. All right. Uh, okay, this is a, a good question. Can we explain why 60 days of finding no wimps is still good news in the dark matter search? Oh, and the good one, what would you say the odds are that you'll find when the next 1,000 days of running? Um, all right, the, like first, the, the first one, uh, you know, why is this good news? I think to me, uh, the two things that I would say is one, it's good news because LZ is the, you know, along with, uh, there's two other experiments like LZ, there's Xenon N ton in Italy, and then there's Panda X 4 ton in, in China. These three are the next sort of generation of this type of experiment. Um, and demonstrating that we can build an experiment like this on this scale and achieve the goals that we set out in our design process is sort of a triumph of engineering and design, right? So we built the experiment and it works as we thought it would for the most part. Uh, I think that's a success and says that, you know, when we said that we could run for a thousand days and have the sensitivity that we wanted to have, that is now within reach based on the first the early performance. Um, so that's why I think it's good news. You know, we weren't running in 60 days. We weren't expecting to get too far beyond the current best limits. So in some sense, you know, there was only a very limited range where we could have seen WIMPs that would not have already shown up in hints in the previous experiments. So there's a lot of room to run with LZ. That I think is the good news. You ask me, what are the odds that we're going to find one? Um, if you ask on any given day, you'll get a different answer. Um, I think in a highly public setting, I'll sort of limit myself to saying probably less than 50%. 
but more than 10%. And I think that's probably pretty optimistic, but that's where I am at the moment. Um, so that's my answer. But that, of course, is not a scientific community answer. That's my personal view. So the next question is, can you see, uh, comment on the, on the, yeah, comment on the, on the drift field. Um, so the, the, the question was on the fields, um, because it is true that there's been lots of trouble historically with electric fields and these experiments and other similar types of experiments. So we're running at 32 kilovolts on the cathode. Um, our design goal was 50 kilovolts. Um, in our commissioning campaign, we did successfully run up above 40 kilovolts, so there was nothing uh, in the high voltage application that was limiting us. What we did see was emission of light. Um, and so we backed off in the interest of sort of making progress and moving on to the next thing. Um, I think there is room for us to push the cathode if we wanted to. However, for, um, for our science purposes, we don't need to. Um, the discrimination looks very, very solid with that cathode. Our drift field is, you know, the drift time is perfectly where we want it to be. Um, so we are not gonna push that for LZ um, even though I think there actually is room to run. The extraction efficiency or the extraction region is, is also an interesting case. And we also ran that up to our full design voltage of 11 kilovolts. And again, we saw emission. Um, so there, that is a long discussion that we maybe should have offline. Um, again, we ran down at eight kilovolts, um, primarily because again, we wanted to move on and, and there things were quiet enough to run. We do, as, as Aaron mentioned, still see very short periods of emission during the run. Um, that we were able to easily cut. And we think there is room to explore voltages as well. But again, in the interest of sort of making progress at a place where we could do the science we wanted to do, that's why we ended up at eight kilovolts. Okay, so that gets uh, that. So I'll make one comment is we yeah. are now five minutes past the hour. Um, I think we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Um, but I'm happy to sit around for another five minutes. I'm totally happy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Sophia Farrell asks a very interesting question. Can uh, your argon 37 measurements be used to reinform and constrain the spallation rate? That's a great question. The answer is probably yes. I think we need to think about it more and we haven't actually uh, spent much time uh, talking about that, but that's an interesting suggestion. So I think so. All right, Yuri asks, it seems like there's a small excess of events at low energy compared to your expectation of the leakage from the ER band. How does this affect your sensitivity? Um, and then how does the LZ threshold compare to the xenon one ton in particular? How sensitive are we to the low energy excess? Okay, so the first question, I'm not sure I actually agree with. Um, if we go back to the sort of main S2, S1 plot, um, the excess of events at low energy compared to expectations of leakage are you maybe referring to these events? Uh, uh, excess of high. Okay, there, yeah. that, that makes yeah. much more sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so these events, um, I think as we went through it, Aaron mentioned that they are, are quasi consistent. They, they are consistent with our background model. That comes through in a few versions of plots, which here we can show maybe um, this one, right? So this is a plot. Let me go to full screen. Um, that shows our expected uh, discrimination at some level. So this is the observed S2 minus the mean of the ER band divided by the width of the ER band. So ERs should live around zero and then a WIMP search would live you know, somewhere off here in the nuclear recoil band. <clears throat> um, so this p-value is perfectly fine, 0.33. So there's nothing crazy about those, energy, those high events. Um, it's also true that in our tritium calibration data, um, we do very, very carefully calibrate that whole region. And you might imagine when we first you know, looked at the data set, we looked again more carefully at that model to make sure we were doing it right. Um, and we did. Uh, we think in the end that we do have that model all the way out to something like three or four significant uh, standard deviations from the mean. That's why the tritium for us is so, so critically important because we can really fully calibrate with excess of statistics, the ER band in our data set. Um, so, to conclude that word salad, I would say that they are, you know, there is leakage, but the leakage is known to get a little bit worse at high energy. It's not inconsistent with our expectation. Um, and so I don't think in the long run that we're too concerned about them, but you know, it could also be the first hints of something coming in. So yeah, I was gonna uh, say, I don't, I don't think concern isn't really a thing. I'm, I'm just excited to see what happens in SR2 and SR3 uh, um, going forward. And then the second question about the thresholds comparing to xenon one ton, 
Um, I think maybe that's best answered going back to the Xeno one ton slide, <coughs> which is um, you can maybe get a sense off of comparing their roll off to sort of our roll off and they're roughly comparable. So we think we have full sensitivity in this two to four KEV region uh, where the bulk of the excess lived. Um, and we think we understand our threshold well enough to be able to say what's going on if there's some sort of exponential rise. Um, good questions, thank yeah. you. Uh, does that mean there is a possibility of low mass detection? We yes. mentioned two signal on an earlier side. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there is. It depends what you mean by low mass. Uh, you know, like I, like Hugh mentioned, we we cut off the the search at at nine GeV uh, below that. Um, but but certainly, I mean, we we see how clean our data. Let's see, let me go back. You can see how clean clean the the nuclear recall band is down here. This is a thirty GeV wimp. Um, as you go lower in mass, the, the expected distribution gets lower down here. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely something um, we, we, we hope we can detect depending on what the characteristics are and depending on how low in mass that you're, you're talking about. Um, there's an interesting question here about the argon 37 rates um, where we could potentially be over subtracting that background. <clears throat> um, I agree that that's important to do correctly. Um, the main, I guess, savior in my mind uh, I mean, we should always be, be careful about this, but it, it is, it's very peaky and it has this, uh, this time, time decay. So we did not explicitly include the time decay in this fit. Um, that is something that we can do moving forward to confirm the argon 37 component. So far, those studies are not inconsistent with what we've done here, um, but it's a good point to make sure that we have that nailed down. Yeah, I think, I think in my mind, seeing that peak and when we were looking at the, its behavior over time, the smoking gun of something like this is: Does it decay with the right half-life, and is it is it inconsistent with a with a constant decay rate? And we answered those questions uh, internally. And again, we're not showing that at the moment. But um, the, the other thing, it, as Hugh said, it's a peak. It doesn't look anything like a wimp. So for a wimp search, it's pretty innocuous, except for maybe introducing a little leakage. But also, it's in the ER band here. So um, you know, if, if it's not R nine thirty seven, imagine imagine that with solar axions, that's still a background for a wimp search. So uh, you know, he, think, he's, you know, he's actually followed up to say, also in this particular case, it wasn't a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I may take this moment to highlight a feature, which is we mentioned we have this power constraint that is coming from this region of the data set um, where my cursor is right now. There's a, a small deficiency of events there. Um, we looked at that very carefully. And in the backup slides, we go through, you know, we have sensitivity in this region all the way through. Um, so here are some slides that show you what's going on. In particular, our tritium calibration, our DD calibration. Full screen. Uh, I'll go to full screen. Um, so, so tritium, which has all the same cuts as the WIMP search, you know, fully uh, fills out that region. Um, and DD, which is our, our signal calibration, again, it fully fills out that region well above where the main bulk of sensitivity is. Um, and then we can also do this cool thing with the Xeno-127 where we tag the Xeno-127 with uh, the skin. Um, and Xeno-127 has an M shell at one keV electron recoils. And we see the expected number of events below that deficit um, throughout the run. So we feel that this is a fluctuation which leads to that power constraint that we showed earlier. Um, right. uh, so how do you confirm that there's no tritium before the calibration? Um, well, we, we uh, we measure the, the radon rate. That's the thing that dominates. We also have a known amount of Krypton 85, which we mentioned. Um, and there's no, there's no hint in terms of our rates. And, and also uh, tritium has a, has a spectral shape that's a little bit different than our other beta emitters. It's, uh, it has a very uh, low endpoint and it peaks uh, at very low energy. So there's no hint of that in our data um, uh, beforehand. Yeah, I, mean, I guess technically we don't actually confirm there's no tritium, it's just, in our fit, you know, the, the background model that contains no tritium fits very, very well. So there's no sign that we need to add something like that. Um, and then we also do, when we do the tritium injection, before we did that, we injected methane to show that we could move, uh, that the methane would come out as expected before we did the injection of tritium. Um, and then this last one about the argon-37 electron capture. So why does argon-37 look more like an electron recoil than a nuclear recoil? Um, it's actually that you get a vacancy in the electronic uh, shells, and so higher level electrons fall down, and they then that, that kicks out, um, you know, OJ, X-rays, low energy, ER type um, interactions. It's not the recoil that we're looking at, it's the energy released in the electron cascade. 
Are you going to do some sort of uh, annual modulation analysis with LZ? Yeah, I think that's certainly uh, uh, something we can do with uh, this run so far. Uh, you know, the, the the run span something like was 100 days. Um, we could look for it. We'd like to have you know more than <laughs> than one cycle, uh, but certainly long term uh, data sets we will be able to use for annual modulation right. searches. Yeah. And then the last question is, what does this experiment mean for the scientific community? I think I sort of gave my opinion actually and answered the question earlier about demonstrating that these scale experiments can be built. Um, and that you know, is a, a wonderful statement about how far we've come and pushing this technology. I think it provides um, arguments about how we might build the next generation. And ultimately, I think it's the scientific community who has to decide what the meaning of this experiment is. And so I hope everybody who's attended today uh, comes away and, and tells us what they think. So maybe we should stop there. Yeah, so. All right. One, more, one hand raised. Oh, one oh, hand. We can do it. Um, so Gilbert, you're still muted if you're trying to. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I missed something. Oh, we can hear you. We can hear you. Um, I, do you want me to repeat my question in the Q and A chat? I, I think go for it now. Yeah, verbally. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry about that. I was wondering what the um, time schedule is, the, the expected completion schedule for the new detector that that uh, the new collaboration is working on. Well, so yeah, so I, th I think you mentioned that we had our first meeting just to basically agree that we want to do that. You know, we're in the middle of just starting up LZs. You know, and Enton is in, just starting up Enton. Darwin's in the in the still in the in the design phase. Um, we don't know what the time time scale is for that. Certainly, after we've completed the current phase of experiments, but it's I mean some I mean you can expect nothing before five years. I think is um, certainly the, the and case. of course everything depends on funding to some level. So. I hope everybody sees these results and goes to Snowmass in a week and a half and says, we really should build that experiment because that's what I think we should do. Uh, okay, maybe we should thanks so much. Maybe we should end there. Um, <laughs> thanks to everybody for coming. Um, thanks again to SURF, uh, to the DOE, to SGFC, to um, FCT and IBS. Um, thank you to LZ collaborators, some of whom are in this room. Um, and I hope we will get to talk about this some more. Thank you very much. <laughs>